Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I am going to keep my bios incredibly short because we have a lot to get through, and I think we might run out of time if we don't. Uh, next to me is Wendy Davis. She is the former Democratic candidate for governor. Before that, she was a state senator who represented the Fort Worth area for several years. Next to her is Olivia Messer. Olivia is a reporter for the Daily Beast. She currently works in New York, but she's a Texan, who previously reported for the Waco Tribune Herald and spent some time at the Texas Observer. Next to her is State Representative Donna Howard. Uh, Representative Howard, who is a Democrat, um, is a former nurse and was elected in 2006 to represent House District 48 in Austin. Next to her is Senator Joan Huffman, who is an attorney from Austin and was elected to the Texas Senate in 2008. She represents Senate District 17. And last but not least is State Representative Ina Mijares, who is an attorney from San Antonio and was elected to represent House District 124 in a 2015 special election. Thanks for being here with us today. I want to jump right in um, sexual harassment, hostile work environments, and, and sex-based discrimination have been outlawed for decades, both in federal and state law. And yet we know that this, this problem really hasn't been rooted out. Uh, we know that the pervasive culture of sexual harassment at the Capitol has gone on for years, if not decades, um, but it's simply gone unchecked for so long. Uh, walk us through, you know, how did we get to this sort of collective reckoning and, and why is this happening now? Who wants to start? start. Right. <laughs> um, I think it's definitely partly caused by the national conversation we're having, um, but there's been a change internally at least with women who uh, largely work on the Democratic side who were making this list for years to figure out how to handle um, job decisions, their work environments, and were warning each other about men in the legislature and in Texas politics who were not to be in a room alone with or um, who were discriminating based on pay. Um, that burn book is obviously what I wrote about in my story a few months ago um, and kind of opened up this bigger window for other women um, to come forward with allegations about men in the legislature. I think without them having done that, um, we wouldn't be having this conversation. And I honestly think the moment actually is occurring because there's a way now to speak out about these issues that really hadn't existed heretofore. Previously, if you were a, a woman in a workplace or a man who was um, experiencing sexual harassment, you had a couple of avenues to turn to. You had the human resources department or you had the court system. And in the first instance, oftentimes that kind of fell into a vacuum and went nowhere. In the second instance, it takes a lot to meet that court requirement, that legal requirement, and for someone to come forward and go through that process, it's pretty remarkable. But now, we're at this pivotal moment where women have taken the conversation public in ways that weren't available previously. And when I think about kind of the tipping point of it, I believe it really happened with that young woman that worked within Uber. And the fact that she wrote an open letter as she left that company after she had tried to go through the human resources department to complain of the sexual harassment that she and others were experiencing, and it fell, of course, on deaf ears, she turned to a public communication vehicle and created such an uproar that the board was put in a position where they had to respond to what was happening to them publicly because consumers had an opportunity then to play a role in being kind of judge, jury, and decision maker in terms of bringing a consequence to the table. Representative Howard, Senator Huffman, you, you've been at the legislature for some time now. Does this feel different this time around? Uh, absolutely, it feels different. <clears throat> and I think that what you just heard from both uh, Wendy and Olivia is, is really key to why it's different now. Uh, there have been these tipping points that have occurred. There's been social media 
there's been um, the opportunity for women to be able to come forward and know they have a collective voice. Uh, there have been instances in the past, we all probably know about them, where there have been public um, uh, allegations of uh, inappropriate behavior. Um, and I mean, just a, the classic example, of course, is the Anita Hill situation, where the women have been put in a position of being re-victimized or blamed for these inappropriate behaviors, <laughs> most often on the part of men. Um, that has stifled uh, women coming forward and talking about it. Mm -hmm. Whatever made this actually change, it has changed. It's definitely different than it was. Women are able to speak up now and are feeling safe in doing so, are feeling like they're actually being believed that actually people are recognizing and saying out loud that this is a problem and we do have to do something about it. We've known it's a problem for a long time. Uh, maybe some of us have more specific examples than others, but we've known it at the Capitol for a long time. And Olivia's article was one in 2013 that really brought it to the forefront for a lot of us, but we still didn't take action until what's happened recently when we were forced to look up close and personal at the fact that this is a problem. We look at our policies and recognize that they are not uh, being protective, that they are not giving good guidance, that they are not uh, giving the confidence to those that are recognizing this happening in the Capitol to feel like they can actually come forward and trust that that policy is going to mean anything. So uh, yes, it's different. And I don't see how we can go back. The genie's out of the bottle. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. I would, I would say uh, I agree that, that it feels different. And I think that it boils down to women feel like there's safety in numbers. As women, we've all heard that. And I think that as the national conversation has developed, that um, women around the United States in every type of workplace and every type of situation, not just the legislature, certainly, um, have felt that now they can come forward. Um, this last session, I advocated for our campus sexual assault reporting bill, and it was really geared towards getting the numbers out there so women could see, mm -hmm. hey, I'm not alone. There's a lot of people that this has happened to, women and men as well, but mainly women. And they didn't report, but there are a lot of other women that this has happened to. And I think as women get that information and they're informed, then they, will, then they will move forward. And as women begin to report, and that's the key, report quickly, report accurately, and report to the right place, that, um, that this, we can change this socially, culturally, and that's what we really need to do here, is just make this behavior unacceptable, just like any other social um, s things just aren't acceptable. It just, it's just we have to have zero tolerance and let women know that they're gonna, as you said, be protected and at least get a fair shake as to some kind of examination of what went on. You know, I, I, I think back at uh, Gretchen Carlson coming forward on Roger Ailes and talking about her experience uh, with sexual harassment when she was working um, in the news industry. And I recall at the time how her colleagues and other people in that industry just maligned her for coming forward. Mm -hmm. And I keep thinking about, you know, for me, that really started the conversation and then it evolved to um, Roger Ailes paying that settlement and then her colleagues apologizing to her for not believing her and then the Me Too movement. And I think what's happened is now it, start, it has started a national conversation for, for women and men in all different walks of life and all different types of occupations to finally start coming forward. And I, re I recall, I remember on Facebook and that social media push when everybody started hashtagging Me Too. And there were a number of well-respected women that I look up to back in my community that put that on their social media and started talking about their personal experiences. And I think it humanizes everybody. And I think it woke up everybody to understanding the problem and the need to start addressing it. I, I do want to get to the policies that are in place at the Capitol. But, but first, I wanted to ask Senator Davis, um, you know, I think it's clear that there are a lot of challenges and impediments for women who want to come forward. There are a lot of things that they have to consider and their livelihoods and, and so many other factors. And we know that 
in a lot of ways, there's a, a component of power and privilege that comes to play into whether women can come forward. Uh, but we know that even at the Capitol, having power doesn't necessarily nullify some of those fears. Senator Davis, I, I'm reminded of the disclosure you first made to us a couple months ago about your experience um, with, a form, with a former lawmaker or colleague. Mm -hmm. Being in that position, I mean, it seems like you still felt that there were things that you couldn't come forward about completely. Yeah, you know, it, it's such a, it's a difficult line that women walk when it comes to sexual harassment in the workplace. We have been sensitized to believing that if we make a complaint or we even speak out publicly about an experience that we've had, that somehow we are being weak. Uh, we are perceived as complaining, perhaps um, asking for special treatment, and it's a conditioning. The great thing about what's happening right now is we are reconditioning, and we are empowering young women all over this country by watching the role models of what's happening to understand that we should feel empowered by speaking out when something like that happens. Most of the time, sexual harassment in the workplace is occurring because of a power differential. And I was fortunate that when I had that experience in the Texas legislature, I was in a position of power so that I could basically participate in my own sort of recourse for that. Um, the person who perpetrated this act on me was a House member, and I and a, a lot of my colleagues who were in the House made sure that for two sessions he could not pass a single bill. So we took recourse, we took action. But think about so many of the young women who work in the Texas Capitol, who were there already in awe of the people that they are working with and for. Elected officials who all bring with them a sense of ego and entitlement. And there is this sense of deep abiding respect that the young people who work in that capital have for those elected officials. And sadly, that's taken advantage of. And right now, as Representative Howard said, there really hasn't been a process in place where they feel like they can safely report and certainly don't feel like there's a process in place where if they do report, there's going to be some consequence for doing that. So in their minds, why risk it? I I'll say it's truly frustrating um, at the moment because I know there are many other women who want to come forward but fear recourse or want something to change but don't want to have to take on that sacrifice and that personal burden. And some of them are reporters, some of them are staffers, some of them I'm talking to, but uh, reporting through the media, it's not... Um, it's not a solution. I, I'm, I'm, it's a big part and it's important, but it does not solve the problem. It's a systemic issue. There should be a way for women not to have to put their story out for public consumption, to be nitpicked, to be argued over, um, and still get justice. There should be a way for that to be possible. And it should not just be for women who are staffers. It should be for reporters and lobbyists who require access to do their jobs and have to put themselves at personal sacrifice to get things done and have had to swallow this burden for years, have had these things happen to them that they have to decide, is this worth putting my entire future career at risk to talk about? And most of them say no. Most of them say, no, it's not worth risking the rest of my career for the sake of this one person being outed for this one thing. But the women who have done that, it's incredibly brave, but it shouldn't be, requi it shouldn't be a requirement. Well, and, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, and, and mentioning the power differential, obviously that's a common denominator with uh, a lot of the industries that we're seeing this occurring in. What makes, of course, the legislature unique in this way, though, is that we don't have employers and supervisors. Mm -hmm. uh, we are beholden, if you will, to those that elected us. 
and there's not a good process in place for the electorate to weigh in. Uh, with senators, it'd be every four years. With reps, every two years is when you weigh in. Uh, and, and so there's the, the power differential that, and also uh, a very muddy way of looking at how do we hold people accountable who don't have uh, supervisors, who don't have employers. Mm -hmm. And that's something that uh, state legislatures throughout this country are grappling with right now. Some are taking actions. We're obviously going to be looking at that here in Texas. But um, how, do you, how do you hold somebody accountable that is kind of autonomous in their own office, uh, that has nobody above them, that, uh, as you've been hearing, uh, we're all dependent upon one another. Relationships are what are so important about making legislation work. You have to build those relationships and um, you have to count on different people for votes and support and whatever. If you insert yourself in a way that questions them and how they behave or pr bring some kind of negative publicity to them, you're threatening your own ability to uh, be effective. And as Olivia has mentioned with journalists, uh, it's extremely important that they be given access and that they not have to be concerned about how they, how they respond to somebody's inappropriate advances, that that somehow will stifle what they're able to do to report the, the news. Uh, the policy that we have, we did include interns. That was a step in the right direction. We did not have that before. Uh, but we have not addressed yet the third independent parties like uh, journalists, and we need to do that. And there are other states that are doing that, and that's part of what we're doing is looking at what are the other states doing, what best practices can we find here that are going to allow us to look at this bigger picture and make sure that everybody who has business at the Capitol can come there and be protected. And I, I want to talk a little bit more about the policies in place at the Capitol. I, you know, as we started reporting on it, um, that was a, a clear thing that we wanted to look at and clear and quickly realized that they were outdated and probably had hardly been updated since 1995 when they were enacted. The House's policy, for example, mentioned a state agency that no longer existed. Um, and we realized very quickly that according to just about everyone who works with victims of sexual harassment, that the policies were flawed and, and anemic in their protections for for women or anyone really who comes forward and makes a complaint. Um, and there's a weird component of, of oversight, as you mentioned, Representative Howard, where you have elected officials who at the end of the day are elected by folks back home. And so I, I wanna ask, you know, the House has revised this policy. The timeline is a little bit more unclear in the Senate. Um, we've been told that Senator Colchris is collecting recommendations that she'll take to Lieutenant Governor. I, I wanna hear um, from our lawmakers, and I might put you on the spot, Senator Huffman, about what changes we actually need to see in those policies to get at some of the skepticism that's in, that exists now for women who don't come forward because they don't feel protected by those policies. Well, as you said, the Senate has long had a policy in place, but perhaps women weren't adequately educated and aware of that policy and didn't feel protected enough to actually follow through and use the procedures in place. So yes, they do need to be strengthened. The Senate, Senator Colcourse Administration Committee is working on ideas and ways to do that. But, but foremost, we need to make sure that we create an environment and a process where women feel they can come forward, or men, whoever it is that feels like they've been um, uh, a victim of this type of behavior, that, that they can come forward, make the complaint, but on the, on the flip side, there must be a way of due process also for those that are accused so that they have an opportunity to either respond or there be some type of discussion about it or some type of uh, venue where um, the facts are kind of laid out and, and determined. So um, yes, we need some changes, but we have to remember, keep the victims safe, make sure that they feel like they can come forward and they'll be protected, and then a due process factor for those who are accused, I think has to be part of the discussion. Some folks have, have mentioned sort of an independent investigative body to sort of get at that due process and ensure that it's guaranteed for, for all parties involved. I think there are clearly some complications that come with creating an independent investigative body of that sort. I'm curious um, 
among our lawmakers and, and the other panelists really if, if that's the solution and if that gets us toward a better place in enacting a system that feels safe for people. Well, I, I definitely think we need to look at some kind of third party for sure. Um, I don't think that anybody would think that this wouldn't be a political process and that politics would insert itself in a way that could be negative in any kind of investigation if it was left up to legislators to police ourselves. Not to say that we can't do some things ourselves, but to give assurance to those that there's going to be true investigation that looks objectively at what's going on, including at, at the harasser and, and what their story is as well, I, I get that. Um, but that that requires that we take the politics out of it as much as possible. Can we do that totally? I don't know. You know, we have an ethics commission that I think a lot of people would say doesn't have a lot of teeth to it. It's uh, created by us. They get their money from us. You know, who, how are we going to come up with this third party investigative entity? Uh, who's going to decide who that is? How is that going to be paid for? Probably with some kind of state appropriation. So we would again be holding some purse strings and we know we've seen time and time again how we manipulate uh, those kinds of entities that we create based on the purse strings. So yes, there's obviously complications to this and I don't know what the right way is to move forward. Other states have appointed uh, these third party investigators or uh, some kind of entity and I think we're going to have to look at that. And in fact, our policy, our revised policy in the House does give that option to look at when necessary, I think it says, uh, a third party uh, investigative entity. Um, so yes, I think we have to do it. I think it's complicated. I don't know what the right answers are for it. That's why we have to spend some more time deliberating this, gathering more information, hearing from the advocates hearing from those that work in this field so that we can look at what is best to move forward that will provide, we keep hearing this over and over again, the assurance to those who have complaints that they can come forward and know that their complaint will be looked at respectfully, timely, and without political interference. Well, and I, I think part of, part of what has to happen you have to have the right process in place mm -hmm. to determine what the right process should be in order to adequately respond to these complaints and to give survivors a safe place to go. I look at you know, what, what's happening in the Senate right now and I have to say I'm, I'm concerned about that process. There's been one hearing at that hearing, the only people that were invited to speak were the Secretary of the Senate and someone on her staff. No victims' rights organizations, no um, people who wanted to come forward as survivors and talk about their experiences, no experts in the field that could talk about best practices and uh, what we might consider in the legislature as a best practice to move toward. And it's hard in that kind of a vacuum to really arrive at the right place. So what I hope will happen going forward through this interim and then hopefully into the next legislative session is that there will be a more robust conversation that involves many other perspectives and backgrounds and experiences to arrive at the kind of uh, objective, intake process and response process so that survivors who come forward will feel as though they're surrounded in some protective way. No one wants to come forward and do something this hard if they feel like it's just going to fall into a hole somewhere. And I think that's the problem that exists right now in the Texas legislature, not just in Texas, but in a lot of other states as well. But there are models of that. And though the ethics um, committee right now is, of course, as Representative Howard said, subject to the legislature in some way, shape, and form, they've at least investigated ethics complaints 
Um, they have come forward in finding that people have violated ethics in the state of Texas. And going forward in electoral contests, that information is used in a way that that person now has to respond to. So there is some accountability there that at least exists on the ethics side, but doesn't certainly exist at all on the side of sexual harassment and assault within that particular workplace. I think that also brings up a, an important point about transparency. Um, many of these issues have been dealt with internally um, in a way that uh, maybe it's addressed directly with the lawmaker. I've had multiple women come to me and say uh, that it was dealt with internally, the lawmaker was reprimanded, but no one else ever heard about it. And what happens there sometimes is that then it happens again and again and again, and it is dealt with internally over and over and over again. And there's no actual justice, but also there's never any chance for voters to find out that this is something that their representative is doing over right. and over and over again. And it solves part of the problem, right, because sometimes it stops, at least with that one particular victim, but it, there's this bigger other issue, not bigger, mm -hmm. other issue that is also important, which is that it doesn't stop them from acting again, and it does not stop and it does nothing to inform voters about what's happening. And just from a journalistic standpoint, obviously transparency, in my opinion, is important, but these, these things should be documented in some way. Currently, they are not being documented, and that means that they are not subject to public information requests. There's a lot of other issues there that come when these things are dealt with off the books and, had, and are dealt with through private verbal conversations over and over and over again it does not solve the problem long term. Well, and there seems to be a clear issue of enforcement as well, right? I mean, we, we the House created an additional training that now is mandatory for lawmakers and staffers, but you can't actually require lawmakers to take it. There's nothing in state statute that allows for that. Um, and when we think about any sort of disciplinary action that could happen, that could, or any sort of sanction against a lawmaker that come down, there seems to be a lot of questions about whether anyone actually has the power to do that. I mean, mm -hmm. how do we even overcome that and encourage people to come forward to help address this when there's no sort of assurance that anything will happen to the person that is harassing them or assaulting them in any way? I, th I think we're making this way too complicated. I think that basically we need to have a culture of zero tolerance, zero tolerance. We need to have a process by which women could come forward and make a complaint and a process by which those who are being accused can respond and there be some type of arbitration about what happened. As to your issue on transparency, it's gotta be up to the victim, all right? We protect the victim. We, we found this through the campus sexual assault bills. There was some pushback because of concern of the identity of the victim. The, the ultimate arbiter of, of the punishment for, the, for those who perpetrate this are the voters. So the power really lies with those who are victimized. The women that you're talking about, they have every right to go forward, write an open letter to the constituents of an elected official and tell them what happened. That is um, part of what you can do if you're a victim. The victims who have come forward now publicly, nationally, um, are having a pretty darn big voice in this discussion and women uh, at the Capitol can do that as well if they choose to come forward and um, make it known what happened to them. But there has to be a process by which those who are accused has a, have a way to respond, but it, in it's my not, opinion. But it's not just up to the, those that elect us, because I think we do still have some role to play here. Um, again, I don't know what the specifics should be for us, but we can look at what some other states are doing right now, and they've actually created uh, some of the states have created a process that does allow for a legislative uh, committee to receive complaints and to investigate and to uh, come up with certain sanctions. Um, I, I have a, 
I have a hard time thinking that we would absolve ourselves of all responsibility here because we are creating the environment in which these people work. Mm -hmm. So I agree that uh, the electorate needs to be the final decision maker about who's there, but we can have a role to play in terms of committee assignments and leadership roles and uh, censuring and um, actually there is a process we have in place for uh, uh, dismissing someone, you know, it has to, it would be a huge thing to go through. I don't know if it's happened before or not, but uh, you, you know, we, we can't just give it back to the voters, especially if, well, let's just, I mean, just think about if, if something's happening and it's on a continuing basis and uh, there's several years before it's gonna come back to the voters for them to vote on. I mean, I don't see how we can responsibly not see that we have some role to play here but I think we need to be thoughtful about what that is. And, and I just wanna say, I agree that we have a role to play, but I think our role is to establish this culture of zero tolerance. Um, I think we, th those of us in the legislature can agree that we can sit down with our colleagues and say, we ain't putting up with this stuff. This is, this is over. Maybe this is the way it used to be, but it's not like that anymore. And I think that there are enough voices now um, elected officials, officials who are ready and willing to step forward and to, to, I know personally, I plan to sit down with my staff at the beginning of every session or, or yearly and say, this is, this is what you can do, this is what you can't do, and if you, um, and you, and especially to the men, and to the women say, if you feel in any way, shape, or form that you've been harassed, you need to come to me or my chief of staff immediately and let us know whether it's from another member, whether it's an elected official, whether it's someone who works anywhere in the Capitol and need to let me know. And I personally would do something about it immediately. So I think there are plenty of elected officials and I think everyone up here is an elected official would, would do the exact same thing. Now, yeah, sure, there may be some who aren't willing to do that, but I think as we change the culture, um, you know, deterrence is, is, a, is a powerful thing. And as there's shame and as there's um, discussion and attention brought to these issues, I think the behavior will quickly dissipate. I, I do truly believe that. I just Olivia, I, I just want, Representative Mihadis has been waiting to jump yeah, in. You know, I, I'm looking, uh, you know, zero tolerance is important, but we've got to look at what are the prevention measures that are going to be put in place. I understand we're going to have a, a training video, but how effective truly is that? And it's done every two years. Uh, you know, I think that there needs to be a definite uh, concentration on the type of prevention methods we're going to use. But again, I agree with Representative Howard. This policy, this you know, creating this policy, we've got to incorporate everyone to have a say so in it because we want to make sure the public has trust in it and that it's transparent and it's something that's going to be productive because if we just do a policy and it's not going to do what we hope it'll do, it's going to be another failure and I don't want that to happen again. I also, I just don't understand, I guess, this, um, if you have a zero tolerance policy, what happens when a legislator is accused of uh, perpetrating multiple crimes against multiple people? Well, and, and I want to ask about that because, Olivia, you reported allegations against uh, Senator Boris Miles and Senator Carlos Zuresti, and the women that you talked to and the folks that you talked to spoke anonymously, or I think you used pseudonyms because they did not feel comfortable uh, using their own names for fear of reprisal or anything that could come with that. I, I want to ask the, the lawmakers, you know, reading about these allegations against your colleagues and former colleagues and knowing the fear behind someone attaching their name to some sort of allegation, what should the next step be, specifically to these allegations that have been put out there on, on two lawmakers who are in office right now? Yeah, I, I, I'm not a lawmaker anymore. Um, but I think this really speaks to why it is that we can't impose too much of an expectation on the survivor bringing the solution forward themselves. There is fear of reprisal. And it's not just young staffers, it's people who are in the lobby who are, whose clients depend on the relationships that they have with lawmakers in that capital, and who, if they come forward, actually put their careers at risk, or even their clients at risk, and they have concern about that. The fact that some egregious 
uh, instances of harassment and assault have occurred, um, allegedly, by lawmakers in that capital, and yet the people who have been victimized by them are afraid to come forward says a lot about the fact that we do not have a process in place where they feel like, number one, it will make a difference, so why put myself at risk? And number two, that at the end of the day, they will be surrounded by belief and protection. That is not the culture in the Texas Capitol right now. And I don't know how it is that you go forward as a Senate body or a legislative body and hold accountable the folks who are mentioned in this article, where you haven't created a culture so that reporting can come forward, even confidentially, um, and make the people who do that feel safe. If, if the folks who have been on the receiving end of this assault, this harassment, don't feel like they can come even privately uh, to legislators and talk about it, I, I, I don't know how you possibly respond. And it just goes back to the bigger question of what is a process that you can create that will make that person feel as though their reporting is actually going to result in a beneficial consequence. Uh, you know, it's, the, the timing of this, of course, is, uh, I don't even know what word to use. Interesting is not the right word. But the fact is that this is all coming out. Olivia's article came out. Uh, the Tribune's article came out. These revelations are coming out at the same time that we're having the Me Too movement. And so it, it does require, I think, that we don't just read it and look at it and do nothing. Mm -hmm. We don't have the processes in place, as Wendy's saying, though, which is also making it more complicated as to what the correct steps are to move forward. I don't know what the correct steps are, necessarily. But at the very least, it appears to me that with these kind of allegations, there should be some investigation. I don't know that any is occurring. I don't know that anything is being done one way or another. And I think that reinforces exactly the kind of obstacles that we've all been talking about here, that we've had these major revelations, whether they're true or not, and you talk about you know, due process, the, the, the allegations are out there hanging out there. If, if that allegation was about me, I think I would want it investigated. So if I thought there was a way that I could redeem myself, I would have that opportunity. I don't know what's, what's going on right now. I don't even know if any formal complaints have been made. We don't have a process in place with transparency and accountability that tells us any of this yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it is putting us in the position of, of being, ha having difficulty with credibility if we're not attempting to at least do something with this situation. Yeah. And I just want to address quickly uh, Wendy's comment that, that the Senate isn't acting. The Senate is taking this very seriously. The administration committee is working on this, and there's been a lot of discussion about how to address this. So uh, I don't want that to be out there as if we're, we're not taking it seriously, because we are taking it very seriously. Um, and, and there does have to be a way, I agree, there has to be a way for women to come forward uh, where they feel like something will happen if, if, it's, if the allegations are, um, are correct and that uh, they feel like they won't be punished in some way for, for coming forward. And I'm certain that'll be part of whatever is ultimately determined. Alexa, I have a question sure. and something that Olivia brought up and I, I, I'm curious to know. Um, open records requests that have been served on the Capitol, have they been complied with? Are they fighting against them? Are they claiming there's no such documents? What can you tell us? Uh, this question actually might be better answered by Alexa, but I, I will just say first that um, I, I know that there are women who have, um, have made complaints or um, someone found out about the harassment that was going on. They had a verbal conversation a verbal conversation was had with the lawmaker in question, and then a verbal conversation was had with the victim saying it had been dealt with, which means, as far as I can understand, there would have been no documenting of this incident and others that followed. 
I can say we requested uh, complaints both in the House and Senate. Uh, the first request went back to, I believe, 2011, and we were told there were no complaints. It, it wasn't so much that there was no documentation, there just weren't any complaints. Uh, later, Chairman Guerin said that he had had complaints but had dealt with them informally, is what he said. So there was no, and no sort of documentation. Patsy Spa in the Senate later said that she had had one back in 2001, which our open records request would not have covered. And there, there was conversation during the Senate Administration Committee's hearing that the complaints and any final reports that would have come from them would be subject to open records requests with names redacted and identifying information redacted. But I'll also say that there was conversation about working to make those exempt from open records requests. Um, we are running out of time, and I'm going to have to skip over a bunch of questions I had, but I, I did want to sort of close out, and folks, if you've got questions, start getting those ready. We are leaving some time for Q&A at the end of this. Um, I wanted to leave some time to acknowledge that sexual harassment is not an issue that's limited to the Capitol. Obviously, our reporting has, and our conversation has focused on that, but we know that it occurs in workplaces where the power imbalance is sometimes magnified when you have low-wage workers who are more likely to be women of color, when you have people in positions where they simply cannot afford to speak up. And so I want to ask each of you, you know, what is the role of the legislature in, in addressing sexual harassment and assault and misconduct in other workplaces in Texas, and, and how should we work to incorporate them into this conversation that we're having now at the Capitol? Well, the legislature ought to serve as a role model. <laughs> Um, it ought to set the tone for what is expected of every workplace in this state. And right now, it's setting the bar, if there's a bar at all, unbelievably low. And I think about the women in this country and men who are working in those power differential positions in low-wage jobs. I remember it so clearly as a waitress standing at a table taking someone's order uh, while a gentleman at the table, and I shouldn't even use that word, put his hand up the back of my skirt. I was a waitress, and there wasn't anything I could do about that. I needed that person's tip because I had a babysitter to pay when I got home. There's so many people in this country that are in that situation, and if they can't look to their legislative bodies as a model of how we will surround them with protection and support, and that we are going to set the tone and the expectation of the way every employer in this state should function, then we've failed them. And so I think this is something we've got to take the current lawmakers and those of us who speak before the legislature and ask for policy considerations we collectively have to take it very seriously because we owe that responsibility to every person in the state, particularly those who are working in, in those situations where they're desperate for their job and they're terrified to come forward when they're experiencing this kind of harassment. I represented, um, I'm an attorney and I represented um, a woman who was a cleaning lady. She would uh, go and, and clean offices after hours um, but she was deemed an independent contractor because she wasn't an employee uh, of the business that she cleaned. So she would clean in the evening, and one evening, one of the executives sexually attacked her. And when I represented her, you know, the, the company said, well, she's not an employee. We're not responsible. You know, during the discovery period, found out that this guy had been preying on cleaning women, different cleaning women. And a lot of these cleaning women didn't speak English. Uh, didn't have a lot of money, um, but it's out there. So, uh, you know, this is just one particular group out there, and I think, you know, as policymakers, we can definitely go in there and see what we could do about uh, liability and, and, and definitely uh, doing our part to ensure that that doesn't happen, but that's just one, one uh, population uh, of, of women that are definitely um, victims at the workplace. Any specific legislation you may be eyeing, Senator Huffman or Representative Howard? I haven't specifically s sat and thought about that. Um, I think there's there are laws in the books, but it's just that 
the culture has prevailed and we just need to change the culture. I mean, I do think that um, the most important thing is for women to come forward, whether it's um, in the workplace or in the legislature, and there will be safety in numbers, and as more women come forward, the more um, this behavior will not be tolerated, and I think eventually it will, it will just be, it's unacceptable now, but it will be quite rare if we just keep bringing this to the forefront. I don't have specific legislation at this point, but certainly those are the things that we're looking at as we uh, determine what needs to be done and things need to be put in statute to, to allow us to have a more robust policy for ourselves, but also in looking at others. One of the things I noticed recently on uh, an IT trip to uh, California was posted in the uh, hotel room uh, information about uh, the people who service the rooms and about how they have been given panic buttons. This is now required there. So that if anything happens, they have a way to alert uh, that, they're, that they're being violated in some way. You know, I, I, I was stunned when I saw it that, that we have gotten to that point where that, that we have to worry about that. But then I think, yes, it's a very vulnerable position for somebody to be in and they need to be protected. So we need to look at the things that we can do, I think, uh, that will protect people, especially those that are very vulnerable, that don't have the power uh, to, to take care of some of these things and, and need that protection. Um, and then also looking at what EEOC and others are recommending uh, be done, not only in uh, legislatures, but in with private employers in terms of approaches that can be taken, whether or not it requires legislation or not, again, I don't know, but there are things that are being used that they're seeing some promise with, such as bystander intervention, uh, making sure that that's available more, that that training is a part of, uh, it's, it's being used a lot on campuses now and uh, with the military with a certain amount of success. Do we need to be looking at ex expanding some of those things that we know can have uh, some positive outcomes. And, you know, no matter what we're talking about here, though, I think everybody recognizes and everything I read points to the fact that it has to still start at the top. We have to change the culture of what's acceptable or not acceptable. We have to have true leadership that says that we are going to be respectful and inclusive and we're not going to allow these things to happen. This is not a part of the culture. And until we do that, um, I think we still are going to have a lot of credibility problems. Folks, we have a couple of minutes for q and I think there's a microphone. Agnes has got a microphone back there. We've got a couple of people here. And I'll just remind everyone, we are limited on time, so keep your questions as short as possible so we can get through as many as possible, please. So, good morning. Uh, my name is Marcia Jones. I'm the executive director from the AFIA Center, and I'm in Dallas, and we are a women-centered organization, and we focus on black women. And so, while well, I think that this is all really great and fine, but I think that there is something missing in this space. So it's really good that we lift up most marginalized women at the end of this conversation, but we're sitting here talking about sexual violence. We're talking about the stuff that happened, and there's not anybody here that represents the people that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important as we move these conversations, we gotta start, we gotta lead by example. And so if we're gonna be talking about this, we gotta really address those women who are least likely, who have the most to lose, mm -hmm. because historically they've lost everything. And historically our bodies, I'm talking about black women, our bodies have not been valued. And for us, sexual violence is bigger than somebody subjectively or objectively, or however you wanna look at it, touching me in a way. No, it is the fact that I'm denied access just because I am black, and so then when I do get access and something like that happens, where do I go? But if nobody who look like me is sitting on a stage like that talking about what's impacting me, then this conversation is almost disingenuous at its best. How do because we bring these folks into the conversation at the Capitol in addressing this? We know a lot of folks are, are scared to sit at a panel, but there are advocates for them. How well, we're do not we... scared, we're not asked. <laughs> How do we make, ensure that they're part of our conversation? Well, I think Marsha made the point. Um, we have to ask, right? Um, and that was a point I was trying to make earlier about the process to date in the administrative committee of the Texas Senate 
no one was invited to come and to share experiences, perspectives, input about what the ultimate process ought to be. So if you don't have the right process in place from the start, which is really the point that Marsha is making, if you don't have voices at the table that bring unique and diverse experiences and perspectives, you cannot possibly hope that you're going to wind up deciding on a process to handle all of these things that's going to be a good one because you left so many people out of the conversation. We've got a hand up there, another one oh, over over here. Um, this question comes from Elena Fowler, former chief of staff in the House and candidate for House District 47. She just had to leave to take her son to daycare. Speaking as a former chief of staff and now candidate for House District 47, chief of, chiefs of staff are the most engaged with staffers and interns in the office. As such, what procedures and training protocols are you putting in place for your chiefs of staff and office to address sexual misconduct when made aware by a staffer? We'll focus on our lawmakers on the panel. I would say from my perspective, it would be if there's any type of, keep your eyes open. If there's any complaint, dig into it immediately, document it and talk to me about it and, and uh, alert me immediately so that I can um, do something about it. Is that already in place in your office? Yes. It's the same with me. I, my, my chief, uh, being that, she, I, uh, my team is all women, <laughs> but uh, if there's always an issue, I expect her to document and come talk to me, and then we'll take it from there. Either I handle it or I have to take it up higher, I will. I'm curious for the, the lawmakers on the panel, obviously the, each office at the Capitol almost works as its own very, very small state agency in some ways. Um, do you think that a lot of these issues are being resolved in each office and, and that that might be part of why we're not seeing these formal complaints beyond all of the challenges and impediments that women are facing? I mean, are, is some of this being handled in each office and is there any way to keep track of that or hold that those actions are actually, and hold those actions accountable that they're working in the right ways? I don't know, that's part of the problem, I think. <laughs> we don't know what's going on uh, and how things are, are really being handled. Um, I've had, some stories revealed to me now that all of this is coming up about chiefs of staff who have had themselves some inappropriate behavior and uh, the situation that is brought to the attention of the elected official who then has to deal with the chief of staff. And I have heard that some resolutions have occurred. Um, you know, I'm sure there's a lot that goes on in an office and, and certainly I think it's appropriate for some internal controls to be in place to correct behavior before. I mean, I don't think we need to, to wait until something occurs over and over again to do something about it. Let's stop it if we can at the beginning and, and, and maybe we can do that internally in our offices. Uh, I think the problem is that, again, going back to transparency, we don't really know what's happening uh, and we don't know then if something is, is being repetitive. One of the other uh, things that I've seen in looking at, at what EEOC and others have recommended is, is something they're referring to as um, information escrow, where uh, you can report uh, some behavior that you feel like could be harassment, but you can specifically request that it be held in escrow until others come forward because you're not comfortable with it yet. I don't know if that's the right thing to do or not, but that's what some are doing as well. I mean, this to me is, is it's so wide open, all the things we need to look at, but I keep going back to this. The, the bottom line is that we don't have something in place right now that gives people the assurance that they can come forward, we can be transparent, we can do what needs to be done here to really get a handle on what's going on. And I don't know, it's a chicken or egg kind of thing, we've got to have the process in place to be able to do that, but we also need to give people the assurance that they can come forward now. So um, I find this, I, I, you said it wasn't, it was not, we were making it too complicated. Maybe we are, but I find it very complicated. Mm -hmm. I think we can squeeze in one or two more questions. Thank you. Good morning, thank you so much for being here. Um, we've talked a lot this morning about things that we can do after these uh, crimes have been committed. Um, courses of action following incidences that were completely inappropriate and in time, at times criminal. 
this puts the onus on the victims to make the change happen. What can we do? What should we be asking of the perpetrators of these crimes? We talk about changing the culture, but we're asking the women, we're asking the victims to come forward. How do we stop it from happening in the first place? I, I think that we have to just, again, as women come forward and the, and the behavior becomes unacceptable as viewed by everyone, including the perpetrators, then we get change. But in the meantime, you know, maybe some people don't aren't, aren't clear about what's appropriate and not and inappropriate. I think it's pretty obvious. But um, I'm all for training in, in sitting through videos or really I like live presentations better and, and getting, you know, elected officials in a room and having kind of a closed discussion but very frank about what what it, what's acceptable and what's not. I mean, some people may need some education and some coaching and some uh, hard talk and tough love, so to speak. And I do think we need to have some of that in the, in the Capitol. It seems pretty obvious, but uh, again, when you look at it, what you can read in the literature and what you can see being done elsewhere, if the places of employment are uh, inclusive, support diversity, uh, don't tolerate inappropriate behaviors, they have less harassment. Mm -hmm. That is a fact. There's also indications that the more diverse the work environment is, the less harassment there is, and there is evidence that the more in, in government positions, in elected bodies, the more women that are elected, the less harassment there is. So there are some things I think that we know can make a difference in setting up an environment that does prevent this behavior from occurring. Um, I think it's really important too though for there to be consequences mm -hmm. and for it to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. If it is taken seriously and it, there are consequences, that is a deterrent and currently <coughs> it is not clear to women coming forward that either of those things will happen. You're right, and it depends on, on the member and what are their own policies within their own office. Uh, there was a situation where my staff had a situation with another member's staff, and when I talked to that member, the member assured me that they took care of it, but I don't necessarily believe that was the case. So what are the consequences? Are, are, is everybody willing to be a team player and institute uh, these best practices. We've got time for one more question. I'm sorry for those waiting in line. Agnes. I'm... Tag, I'm it. <laughs> um, I am Reverend Deneen Robinson. I also work for the AFIA Center. Um, but the thing that I've been thinking about as I've been sitting here, I did my practicum at the Austin Rape Crisis Center. And one of the things as an external body that we made available at that time, and I'm, I'm gonna age myself because that was in the 90s. Um, and I also was a, a messenger for the, the House of Representatives. So I had experience being at um, and a part of our legislature as well as being a part of a community where rape culture was absolutely unaccepted. What I find you guys making difficult is you have an entity in your town who that's what they do. Legislatures gather, they eat together, they have meetings, they do all these things where no one is forcing them to all be in the same space. Someone could take the initiative and invite someone to come in and say, okay, yeah, we were gonna have a talk about this, but." Let's add this to the agenda. You all are here. You're not going to give up your free meal. Listen. Participate in conversation. There are, it doesn't seem to me that there are any built-in incentives for them to change. This is brass tacks here. This is my question. I'm going to get to that. My question is, why are you guys not willing to actually use the resources that you have to be a part of making change happen on the front end versus X number of folks have to continue to come forward 
and then change happened via the back end and people actually experiencing horrific loss in order for change in huge quotation marks to occur. Has there been an unwillingness to use those resources? Um, I don't know if there's an unwillingness. I think maybe there's a, a thoughtlessness. <laughs> I think it's that, that uh, it hasn't occurred to some of us. Um, certainly with the revision to the House policy, we did reach out to some of the advocacy groups to help us look at what we should be including in the policy. But I think what you're talking about goes beyond that and says, let's reach out before we get to that point and make sure that we're inviting those folks in uh, to help us change our environment uh, before we have to even use the policy. Yeah. Folks, unfortunately, we are out of time, but I, I do want to make clear before we go that this isn't the end of this conversation. We are continuing to collect stories of sexual misconduct at the legislature and just this morning launched a call out in hopes of also reaching women outside of the Capitol. If you go to our website, you'll find methods through which you can contact me or my colleague Jolie McCullough confidentially to talk about these issues. Thanks so much for being here. A big thanks to all of our panelists and we'll see you next time.